thanks everyone for joining. Uh, it's really my pleasure today to uh, to be able to join to you and talk about this topic. I know it's certainly important. In fact, I think there's a few other talks that cover similar things. So, uh, yeah, we like to get into uh, sort of discussing how to run how to run Airflow when you've got a lot going on. So, what we'll cover today is just I'll, I'll do a brief introduction of myself, uh, and then we're really going to dig into you know what does it mean to run Airflow at scale, um, and then talk into some specific instances of scaling that are important, right? So the, the uh, actual workloads you're trying to do, uh, the DAGs you're trying to run, uh, and, and sort of get into how do you scale out it and make it efficient to run sort of multiple environments and things like that as well. So very briefly, uh, I'm the uh, uh, product manager that's responsible for Amazon Managed Workflows for Apache Airflow. Uh, so I've been fortunate to work with, uh, with Airflow very closely. Uh, I've been a little over two years with Amazon Web Services. Um, as Pedro mentioned, I'm part of the, uh, the uh, organizing committee for this event, and I'm very proud to be, be so. Uh, I've been in software development, architects, uh, architecture, product management for a little over 25 years now. Uh, and also, as Pedro said, I'm in uh, uh, Vancouver, Canada, and uh, I threw in my GitHub link because I've also uh, managed to do a few contributions to the Airflow project, which I, I've been very pleased to be able to, to contribute. So digging right in, what do we mean by running Apache Airflow at scale? So one sort of obvious thing is just a large bunch of concurrent tasks, right? Just a bunch of things you're trying to get done all at once. Uh, could be spread across different DAGs, could be all in one DAG. Um, these tasks also could be long running tasks. So it may be that you only have a few tasks, but maybe they take hours or days to run and you need to be able to manage those workloads running for that period of time. Uh, it also could be just a, lar a large number of DAGs. Uh, you know, you just have a lot of workflow descriptions. Um, and then finally, it could be just the, the workflows themselves not only are large, but they could be very complicated. Airflow has to work out all of these relationships between tasks and the more complicated those relationships are, the harder Airflow is gonna to have to work to make sense of them all and figure out what to do next. So what sort of considerations do you wanna take when you're running Airflow at scale? Well, one thing to, to, that sometimes folks forget is that Airflow is parsing these DAGs constantly. Whether you have them enabled or not, um, Airflow's gotta go through every single DAG on a regular basis, figure out, you know, load those ta uh, Python modules and figure out what am I supposed to be doing next? And then the DAG objects it creates, they have to be analyzed by the scheduler. And so this scheduler is working extraordinarily hard to figure out, okay, what, what am I supposed to be doing up next? And then the last consideration is typically you have a fixed amount of compute for these. So you may have a fixed number of schedulers or workers. The workers themselves may have a fixed size. You might have a certain number of web servers that can handle the API or your users. Uh, you may have a certain uh, capacity for your backend metadata base. The network is restricted. There's a lot of things that are going to affect how much you can run on any given Airflow environment. So before we sort of get into this, I want to dig into sort of my comment on how the scheduler is busy. So what, what's it doing? What's it spending all of its time doing that it's so busy? Well, the first thing it has to do is figure out well, what, what DAGs have you put in the folder? What should, which Python files are which? So it has a, uh, an endless loop, a DAG uh, file processor, which goes through, looks for new files. Um, it figures out which files it's already looked at recently. Um, it then you know has to process all of these files, figure out the resulting DAGs from those, and it'll log some statistics and, and emit some information Then it just keeps looping on that exact same thing. So, that process files piece of the puzzle is a totally separate process or multiple processes, right? So it's for each DAG that it's processing concurrently, it's gonna spin another uh, a process that goes up, loads the file, loads all the modules, figures out which modules are DAGs, and it returns for each of these DAGs a DAG bag, which is just a list of DAG objects. So on top of all this, the, the scheduler also has to figure out well, what, what tasks are supposed to be scheduled at any time. So it's got to load up that DAG bag from all those different DAG process. It's going to queue all the runs. It's going to, you know, figure out, well, um, you know, it, are the DAG dependencies match? Can I do the next task? Uh, it's going to queue those up as needed. It's going to run some cleanup routines. It's going to do some emitting some additional metrics. Uh, it's going to do all those SLA checks and it's going to do all this on an endless loop as well. And then typically also co-located with the task, uh, the scheduler is also the executor, which is responsible for taking those scheduled tasks, moving it over to queued, 
monitoring the results from the workers, updating that information as well. And so for all, all this is, these uh, events are happening on every scheduler. So the schedulers within Airflow are high availability, but they, they have sort of limited cooperation. And so you can, it's probably easier just to assume that all these are running all the time on every scheduler. And so one thing that's important is to know that there are all these different, um, you know, pieces, uh, uh, adjustable items, can, um, uh, uh, you know, options that you can provide that will get the most out of these for your particular application. So let's take a look at a couple of these. So uh, I mentioned sort of in that process that there is the, the, the how often does it actually look at the, the DAG files? So it defaults to every five minutes, but if you're not updating, if you're not adding new files um, more frequently than that, if you're running a production system, you may not need to check it every five minutes. You know, it's a fairly processor intensive thing. You could probably do it, you know, if you're only running the DAGs once an hour, you can do it once an hour or do it later. Um, the min file process info is also an interesting one because this tells you how often you'll process the DAG if it hasn't changed. So it's still the same file, but maybe it references some dynamic elements, which we'll talk to in a bit. Um, you know, the default's 30 seconds on this, which means it's gonna, whether the files change or not, every every 30 seconds for every file, it's gonna be able to go through and reload that DAG. If it's not changing that frequently or the downstream information is not changing that frequently, you can get a lot more mileage of your scheduler by slowing that down. Similarly with the parsing processes, you can spread these out for the number of actual DAGs you wanna parse at any given time. You don't need to necessarily have a ton of these. The default's two, that's probably lots. You might even be able to do less than that. And then within the DAG file processor itself, you know, if it takes a long time to process these DAGs, you may need to extend that information because otherwise what will happen is the process will time out. It won't return anything, but it's still using up all those cycles. So you need to make sure you've given yourself enough information for to um, uh, enough time to both do the DAG file processing. And then within that, the actual import that turns the DAG file into um, uh, into the DAG object. And there's a great reference in the uh, um, Airflow documentation that talks about the scheduler uh, high availability tunables. Highly recommend taking a look at that. It gets into a lot more depth as to what you can do to really maximize what the scheduler is able to perform on. So let's assume that we've gotten our scheduler just ma maxed out. It's doing the best it possibly can. We have the, the amount of hardware we have available to us. So how do we get more workloads, more actual you know, data processing done with our Airflow cluster? So the first thing is really about offloading the work to something more suitable, right? So Airflow is supposed to be an orchestrator. It's supposed to you know, pull the levers and tell things when to start and when to stop and, and monitor their success. Even though you can do the work on the individual workers, you're really shouldn't ideally you're going to leverage something that's really fit for purpose you know use a uh, kubernetes containers that are sized right or docker containers you use things like ecs or eks uh, to do basically the same thing on, uh, as a managed service use um, uh, emr processes or batch processes or all these other operators that are really focused on you know doing the work you can you know don't run a map reduce within an airflow worker use something like spark to do that and really, that's also a similar sort of philosophy around all sort of ETL jobs, right? Airflow shouldn't necessarily be doing the ETL work itself. Offload that to something like a Spark or Kafka or Hive or something. Or if you're using an analytics database like Snowflake or Redshift, let those do the heavy lifting. Let Airflow do what it's great at, which is making sure everything gets done, giving you the visibility into it, and really focusing on orchestrating that, that relationship between tasks. So... In addition to making sure the work itself is done in the most suitable place, you can also control what gets done first, right? So uh, how often these things are going to occur, how many sort of parallel tasks of a given type are going to run. So you can use pools to say, okay, well, this group of tasks is going to run and this is the maximum I'm going to allow of this type. So uh, uh, an example would be if I have a downstream database that can only handle 10 processing jobs, I can run all of my Postgres operators in a pool uh, that's limited to 10 so that everything else queues up and that way I don't overload that downstream connection. Then also within uh, uh, those pools, you can also assign priorities to say, okay, this job is more important than that job. I, I, this has a higher priority piece of information that you should generate. Um, you can also control the parallelism. So this is really how many tasks you're going to run across all of Airflow. 
And you can also dig into also the concurrency, which you're going to run per DAG, right? So you're really trying to, all these tools give you the ability to say, okay, these are the important tasks. So I want to make sure they get done first because otherwise everything else will get delayed and nothing else will happen the way I want to. And then there's also a, a, a new capability, the, the deferrable operators that uh, Andrew just spoke about about an hour ago, uh, that if you didn't get a chance to watch, I highly recommend going back to that presentation and really looking at how you use deferrable operators to say, well, I'm going to offload. I, I know I'm doing something that doesn't need to actually happen for another hour. So I'm going to defer this for later. So that's a little talk about scaling the uh, workloads, but what about scaling our DAGs? Uh, you know, and what I mean by that is how do I get more workflows done without having to write more code? So, you know, a really key concept around this is the concept of a, DAG, a dynamic DAG or a DAG factory. And there's a few different ways we can look at this, but really what you have is, uh, and this is also something that sometimes uh, folks new to Airflow get confused on, and that is that the Python file in the DAG folder is not in and of itself the DAG. The DAG is a Python object that's generated by that file. So you may have one file that generates many DAGs, or you might have a file that doesn't itself generate any, but you acts as a library to other files that generate DAGs. And so that's typically a dynamic DAG, and there's another session uh, regarding that as well. Um, and then a DAG factory is really just saying, well, I'm going to take some other way of configuring it. It could be JSON or YAML or some other resource to inform that Python file as to exactly how to generate its DAG objects. So really quick and dirty example of a dynamic DAG. So I've got on the left-hand side of the screen here, just as you know, it's it's executing three separate DAGs. Each one is responsible for querying a different table within a Postgres database. So as a dynamic DAG, I may, you know, I'm not necessarily going to want to update this. What happens if there's new tables or new information provided? I don't want to constantly be updating this. And as we scale our Airflow deployment, this becomes harder and harder. You know, it's three tables here, but what happens when it's 30 or 300? So instead, we can have our DAG code get a lot smarter and say, okay, well, we know the tables we're going to need are all coming from this one database. So instead of going through and manually explicitly saying, okay, here are the three tags we want, we can instead go through and say, well, let's just go pull the tables from that database. And maybe there's some other filters, the you know, tables that have a, you know, start with something, um, you know, X, Y, Z. Uh, but anyways, it gives us a, this external source gives us a list of tables that we can use to then create the DAG. So that's the first section on the right-hand side. And the second section on the right-hand side says, okay, now that I have this list of sources, I can go through and just, you know, in a loop, generate one DAG per table. And that will then show up as, as in this example, three DAGs uh, within Airflow. And then tomorrow when somebody adds a new table, it'll be four DAGs. Now, this is super efficient. There's a couple of problems with this. So one is, it's go every time you do that DAG uh, parsing, it's going to go out to that database and run a query, and and it's going to do that as part of that DAG processing loop, which doesn't scale out across all these workers. It's happening all within the scheduler, and we already discussed scheduler is a busy person. Um, so that's one issue. The second is there's no controls as to how much it's doing. You know, what happens if somebody in marketing goes through and creates a thousand tables? All of a sudden now it's going to create a thousand DAGs and maybe bring down our whole environment. So there's no actual sort of control for this. So you have to be very careful when you're using these sort of dynamic things. So as far as that top level code, there is a way we can make this a little more um, efficient. And what we can do then is say, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and take that, um, that code that generates the list of tables and instead of having it as part of the DAG processing or DAG parsing loop, I'm going to take it out into its own DAG. And so I'll have one DAG whose only responsibility is to go to the um, database and create a local JSON file list of tables. And then I can use whatever sort of limits or protections I want to put in there to make sure I don't generate too many. And then separately, I can go through and say, okay, well, I'm now going to take that local file, which is going to read a lot quicker than, than doing a query across to a database, because it's just going to, you know, I can have on the left-hand side, I'm just writing it to a local file system. On the right-hand side, I'm just going to pull from the local file system. Um, and that way I can be a lot quicker in loading it up. It's, it's not going to introduce any latency there whatsoever. And then what I've done is I've just gone ahead and say, well, I'm going to make sure that the DAG that runs 
that goes and pulls the latest list of tables happens at some reasonable amount of time before the interval for the schedule for running the actual processing loop. And that way I can make sure it's, it's caught up, it's up to date without overloading the system in some way. So another element of managing a lot of different DAGs is going to be your, your CICD, your continuous integration deployment. Um, you know, this is where you're adding in the pieces that make sure that is the DAG code valid? Is it accessing the things where we want it to be able to access? Um, are there are the configurations that we need being met for each individual environment? Uh, are we testing it first in a staging environment before we put it in a production environment? And really it has the, 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 the sort of the philosophy that you automate anything. If you're going to be doing this more than once, you can automate it. And uh, Leah Cole this morning had a fantastic talk on CICD. So again, I'm going to defer to uh, to that talk. Go, please go check it out. Uh, it was really informative and goes into a lot further depth about you know how uh, how you can really maximize and be able to handle a lot of different DAGs and a lot of different code using CICD. So uh, another access to this or another aspect to this is providing access control, presumably. If you're managing a lot of DAGs, you have a lot of people to manage. Uh, and, um, you know, you're going to need to say, well, not everyone's going to necessarily, we're going to want to access every possible DAG. And so this is where sort of some access control. So using the role-based authorization within Airflow, uh, you can say, okay, well, this group of people is allowed to access this group of DAGs and this group of people is allowed to access this other group of DAGs. However, important consideration here is that Airflow is not multi-tenant, at least not yet. Uh, and once again, I'm going to say, d defer to some of our other presenters. Uh, Yarek and Matthias are having a session that's either later on today or tomorrow, depending on your time zone, that talks about the ongoing work about adding multi-tenancy to Airflow. But today it's not. And so why that's important is anyone that can write a DAG can access anything that Airflow can do. Right, I can access the metadata base. I can access any other DAGs. I can control you know, executions. I can remove executions. Um, so if you have different teams and you're worried about them sort of um, causing issues with each other's group or, or even more so, um, let's say you have a finance team that has pr privileged information, you can't count on something like RBAC to prevent that access information. It's not what Airflow was intended to do. Um, and again, that is an ongoing, as a matter of fact, it's the Airflow Improvement Proposal 1. Really encourage folks to go in and, and read up on that because there's some really interesting work being done by the, the Airflow community to add in that capabilities. Uh, but we're not there yet. So what can you do in the interim? Well, one thing you could do is, as I mentioned, you have that DAG factory concept. So instead of allowing your users to um, uh, to write DAG code natively and write whatever Python code they want, you can use a DAG factory to say, okay, well, I'm going to let them define relationships between certain subsets of operators. Maybe they're Postgres operators, maybe they're S3 operators, sensors, that sort of thing. I can let them define it in a YAML file or a JSON file. They're not allowed to access the DAG code itself. And then as the DevOps person or the, uh, or the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, data engineer, I'm going to go through and say, okay, well, I'm going to write the code that takes that list and does some checks and make sure it only does certain things that are allowed. And then that information is going to be what actually is run on my Airflow cluster. And you can pair this also with uh, what we just discussed around CICD, because then you can do sort of checks and you can have it automate. So for example, I can say whenever, let's say I have a, a a folder in S3 that I allow um, you know folks to upload their their YAML configuration for workflows, and then as part of the CI/CD pipeline for that, it goes through and adds a uh, role for that end user to Airflow to allow them to then see that DAG. So now you don't have that issue of they can write arbitrary Python code and get access to it. So there are ways to do this, however. If you really want to provide sort of the full power of Airflow to uh, to your end users, then it's entirely possible that adding multiple Airflow clusters may be a better alternative to offer true multi-tenancy versus trying to manage what is available with Airflow today. So 
Let's talk a little bit about that then, because that's, you know, now all of a sudden we're talking about a lot more work, right? It's it's a fair bit of work to manage an airflow environment. Now we're talking about managing potentially many airflow environments and many more DAGs. So first we've got to decide um, how do we actually split this workload amongst environments, right? Uh, what determines which how many environments we need, um, which which users get to use which environment? You know, providing this level of information. So, the first thing is really about is a pretty common one, and that's what stage. And by stage, I mean, is it a production environment, a dev environment, uh, you know, a, a pre-production environment? You might have different environments that come up for those purposes. Uh, some of them might be ephemeral, so you might have a dev environment that is on demand. It spins up to match in some way your production environment, and when they're done with it, you delete it. Um, Another really obvious way of breaking it up uh, is around sort of different groups and different teams. Uh, as I mentioned, Airflow do, you know, does offer uh, some access restrictions, but they're not uh, um, you know, uh, foolproof uh, you know, without putting a lot of extra sort of uh, work on top of it. So um, using, you know, saying, okay, well, the finance team gets this environment and the marketing team gets that environment is one way to ensure that, okay, they, they can't influence each other. They're completely separate environments. There's no way for that to happen. Uh, another is downstream access. So similarly to, you know, how difficult it is to restrict who's allowed to see and do things with an airflow, it's often difficult to restrict what in turn that airflow environment can access. Typically, if I am able to write a DAG for an environment, I can access anything that that environment can access. I can, you know, so if the, if it's a finance database and I, you know, then I have access to it because Airflow has access to it. So you may want to restrict what those each individual Airflow environments can do based upon uh, what they're allowed to access. Uh, another uh, pattern is around priority, right? So uh, I might have environments that, uh, you know, that I need to over provision because they're, you know, a super critical part of my business. And I don't want to wait for those to be delayed by something else that might be happening. Maybe I have some other DAG that most of the time runs pretty efficiently, but sometimes it consumes a lot of resources. Maybe I want to push that out into a separate environment so it doesn't affect the, some of the higher priority ones I have available to us. Uh, it might also be around the, the schedule environment. I might have some workflows that are running 24 seven. So I don't need to worry about scaling the certain number of, uh, of workers or clusters or anything else. Uh, I might be leveraging that as well. And so I may have an environment that runs more on demand or maybe over provisions at a certain part of the day, uh, and have other environments that, um, you know, are pretty consistently provisioned throughout the day because they run you know, workloads every hour, every minute, that sort of thing. And then finally, one other consideration about splitting workloads or, uh, across environments is, um, you know, how much, what exactly is the environment working on, right? What load is, how much work uh, load is there on that environment? Uh, and how do they talk to each other? So if I have an environment that is accessing, um, uh, that has to access a different, you know, the uh, one set of DAGs and it's waiting for that set of DAGs before it accesses a different set of things. Uh, it might be important for me to um, make sure that all the stuff that's related to each other all runs on the exact same environment. So when you're, you know, looking at, again, we're, we're talking about scaling airflow. In this case, we're talking about how do we scale across many environments? Uh, and so now we've got to figure out, well, how do we work efficiently if there's a lot of environments out there? So one is, how do we officially create these? So I might have many different teams that all need to create different environments at different times for different situations. And how do I make sure that's, that's efficient? So I want to leverage tools like Terraform or use the Helm charts, CloudFormation, GitLab. You know, there you could have different Kubernetes setups or Docker Compose setups or a CDK, all of which that's designed to make it super easy for me to say, hey, this team needs another environment. I can spin it up very easily and it's not going to cause a lot of extra effort to do so. Another aspect is then logging, right? So obviously if all these environments were logging to a local file system in the same place, it'd be really hard to find out there's something going wrong. 
So leveraging tools, Datadog, S3, uh, Prometheus, CloudWatch, these sort of tools let you log in all in one centralized place and have tools that let you query them, search for them, um, you know, figure out what each individual environment's doing and be able to see, look for patterns that might indicate problems. Uh, another big aspect of this is monitoring all these environments, right? So it's no good to have a problem and not know about it. Uh, so using things like, you know, StatsD, Grafana, again, CloudWatch and Datadog, these tools all let you see the key metrics within Airflow across many different environments. You can put them all into a, uh, to one place, one dashboard and see what's going on. And then really when you start getting to scale, the, the big benefit of that monitoring comes in alarming, right? So the idea that I know if something's not working correct. And so one aspect of this is, you know, is, is to take, just use things that are built into Airflow like uh, SLAs and callbacks. These can help a lot with these, with uh, being able to effectively monitor, um, you know, even something as simple as just sending an email, right? Hey, you know, this, this, this DAG failed uh, and drop an email to let you know that that's happened. Um, and then just use your email tools to figure that out. But you can also, again, use things like, um, uh, Prometheus or uh, or uh, EventBridge or CloudWatch alarms to be able to really let uh, let you know automatically. Hey, you know, um, so a really common one would be a scheduler heartbeat failure, right? Let me know if an environment's heartbeat is failing. It tells me that it's probably being overloaded, and I need to look at it to sort of see, okay, well, what's what's going on with it? What do I need to look at to see if uh, uh, to see if everything's working correctly or not? So. Let's take a look at how we can take our workload, right? So we have this arbitrary workload um, that we want to be able to spread out across different environments. So I'm going to take a fairly simple but common uh, use case where I've got some folder full of CSV files. So in this case, it's, I'm calling an S3 folder. And, you know, I'm going to add it to Redshift or Snowflake or some other. I need to get it into that uh, in that part of my ELT uh, pipeline. So one thing I could do is simply just insert Airflow directly into that, right? So have Airflow have, you know, an S3 sensor or, uh, that, or maybe as part of the dynamic DAG that just goes through and generates uh, a DAG per, you know, uh, or task for each of these files that's in there. So as part of its, you know, sort of like we talked about with the database example earlier, it'll just go through each of these environments or each of these uh, objects and say, okay, well, um, this object is there, I'm going to generate a dynamic task to go with it. So we could make that a little more efficient, right, by simply inserting a, a database into the into the mix. So instead of just having it go directly to this object storage, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and, you know, every time a file is added or removed, I'll have a little Lambda trigger or some function that goes through and says, okay, I'm going to go through and add this new um, uh, add this new entry into some storage, uh, some database, and then I'll have Airflow again, like my earlier example, just read from that database, right? Uh, and then uh, and then create that information. So, and again, much like the earlier example, we'll make that a little more efficient. Still, we're still working within one Airflow environment, but now we're saying, well, let's just read it from a JSON file instead. So we'll have that that separate task that reads from this database generates a JSON file from it and is able to figure out that, that information as well. And then the next step from this then is, well, now we can spread this out across, now that we have it in a list that we can manage and control and know exactly the, the order that it's going to be, we can go through and say, um, I'm going to go ahead and add some configuration options to my Airflow environment. And so I picked a simple one in here. It could be um, environment variables or whatever, but I'm going to have multiple Airflow environments that maybe I have Terraform stand up, for example. And, you know, Airflow environment one always has a range of one to 400. Airflow environment two can go 401 to 800. Airflow environment three could go 801 to 1200, you know, uh, whatever you'd like in that way. Um, and still work the exact same way. So what we can do is by leveraging that information, we can go through and say, okay, I now, without changing any DAG code, I can control from a configuration option for my Airflow environment, something from airflow.config, what that environment's gonna do. And what's cool about this, if we look at our previous our DAG from before, 
I can actually achieve this with basically a, a few lines of code. So instead of just reading that whole list of sources from that JSON file I had before, I'm going to go through and say, okay, I'm going to pull that airflow environment variable out. And it's just going to be a range for that particular environment. The DAG code is the same in every single environment, but it now knows, okay, for this, for environment one, I know that range is one to 400. Uh, and so it's only going to go through in that range. And you could put sort of, you know, this is obviously a very, um, uh, a very sort of simple example of how you would achieve that. Uh, but you could have some other prioritization, it could be oldest to newest, it could be, um, you know, uh, within different teams, maybe the um, maybe there's a prefix to each individual CS file that tells you which team it goes to. But the nice thing is here is you can still have a single DAG, uh, uh, like Python code that you're actually managing, and then have it, doesn't matter how many Airflow environments you have, it'll all do the same thing. And again, if you use something like, you know, a Terraform or, or other uh, ways to automatically stand up this environment, all the stuff that connects it to monitoring, to your Datadog, Prometheus, whatever, uh, can all be stood up automatically as well. So as soon as you hit some sort of a limit, you can say, oh, okay, well, we now have hit our 1200 DAGs uh, that we can possibly support across three environments. I can spin up a new environment that automatically take, you know, I call it Airflow Environment 4. It knows, okay, that environment goes from 1201 to 1600 and will automatically spin up that information as well. And so you can now make it super efficient to be able to go through and say, uh, okay, I can go through and, and um, easily manage essentially an arbitrary amount of workload without having to deal with an arbitrary number of, of actual DAG files. So before we get into the, the q and I want to point out a few resources uh, to really cover on this. Um, one important one is really the Airflow Slack group. Uh, if you haven't uh, checked that out by now, you definitely need to. Uh, the community is fantastic in Airflow. They're really the best resource for, for information to help you figure out some great tools and techniques. The information I've shared here is just from my own investigation and in talking with the community. So any errors or anything else that are there, you know, the community is, is, is there to, to back all of us up and really give us that sort of information. Uh, really also, you know, kind of goes without saying the airflow documentation is really a, a, is fantastic it's growing all the time people are committing to it all the time uh, i've even committed a few different items to it so please do uh, check out the documentation it's constantly improving if you do see some improvements by all means go in and and, and add some improvements yourself uh, we, we really love the support um, another thing uh, to, to go to as well and i think this came up in uh, uh, some earlier uh, discussion as well is really the actual airflow source code itself Right, go into GitHub, look at what it's doing. Like, you know, they're only, re you know, look and see, well, what does this setting actually control? Where does it exist? It's wonderful thing about open source is it's all there for you to look at yourself and see exactly what goes into each of these, uh, these operators and uh, processes to see how they work. And then just a quick note, uh, there's some stuff on our AWS blogs for the AWS managed work or Amazon managed workflows that's got covers some things like C CI CD and some of these other sort of tunable items and stuff like that. So it's uh, that's also another place to look to. But there's tons more out there. You know, please do uh, check out some of the other resources um, and uh, and and hope this helps you sort of run your airflow uh, at a scale that uh, that that you need for your uh, for your business. Uh, so with that, I'll open it up to some uh, some questions.